In the previous few episodes, I mentioned a particular animal, the sea scorpion. Many curious viewers are fascinated by sea scorpions. Today, let's delve into their story. When it comes to sea scorpions, it really makes me reflect on the tremendous efforts an animal can make for its survival. Sea scorpions belong to the group of arthropods called chalicerates, which are an early branch of arthropods. This branch appeared as early as the Cambrian period and comprised a group of organisms that were on the fringes, similar to the Cotomyris. They were extremely marginal, so much so that you won't find their presence in any Cambrian reconstruction illustrations. They had small bodies and were scarce in number. On the one hand, they had to defend themselves against advanced predators of that time, such as the formidable animal acarids. On the other hand, they had to compete with the thriving trilobites for food resources on the seafloor. Perhaps it was this sense of hidden danger that instilled a strong survival instinct in these small creatures, imprinted in their genes from the very beginning. But coming back to the point, they achieved something that even trilobites, which existed until their extinction, couldn't accomplish. Appendage specialization. In early arthropods, the appendages were generally composed of two parts, one for respiration and the other for movement. While this design was spatially efficient, it created a contradiction. Intense movement would inevitably damage the delicate respiratory portion, but enhanced movement required more oxygen supply necessitating thin and permeable respiratory structures. This design requirement posed a significant challenge. However, as a general rule, the greater the difficulty of a task, the greater the reward. Early chalicerates resolved this contradiction by adopting a specific strategy, specialization. The majority of their appendages completely lost their movement capabilities and were dedicated solely to respiration evolving into what is known as book gills. The foremost six pairs of appendages, on the other hand, lost their respiratory function and became solely responsible for movement. As a result, these chalicerates evolved the strongest and most resilient appendages among all arthropods of that time. They also inadvertently solved the drawback of arthropods, relying on swallowing prey for feeding. The first pair of appendages evolved into a pair of small pincers called chelicery, which assisted in feeding. They used the chelicery to secure their food and then used the small spines on the bases of the subsequent pairs of appendages to grind it into smaller pieces. This adaptation allowed the chelicerates to not only consume much larger food than their own mouths could handle, but also enabled them to escape with the food if necessary, ensuring safe feeding. Although this seemingly minor skill may appear insignificant to us today, considering that other animals in the Cambrian period were relatively ineffective, it was quite a successful adaptation. From then on, a new dominant lineage emerged. However, among the dominant species throughout the ages on Earth, the road to dominance for Calicerata was the most arduous. As Calicerata gradually gained control over more resources, their bodies expanded in size and their strength and speed experienced significant enhancements. Finally, in the Ordovician period approximately 470 million years ago, a group of Caliceratas accomplished a pivotal evolution, giving birth to the legendary creature in the history of animal evolution, the sea scorpion. Strictly speaking, the formal name for the sea scorpion is Eurypterid. However, due to the resemblance of the majority of Eurypterids in morphology to today's scorpions, we will continue to refer to them as sea scorpions for the sake of convenience. Soon the sea scorpions preserved their six pairs of locomotor appendages and underwent further upgrades, transforming them into various formidable weapons. Coupled with their naturally robust exoskeleton inherited from arthropods, sea scorpions finally embarked on their own path to dominance. However, during the Ordovician period, the cephalopods, represented by Camaroceras, dominated the top of the food chain. The sea scorpions could only temporarily evade their dominance. Nevertheless, even during that time, the early sea scorpions, such as Megalograptus, displayed remarkable abilities. 
With a body length exceeding one meter and equipped with formidable long-spined appendages, they were once the rulers of the seafloor. The astraspis, which inhabited the same seabed, had to bury themselves in the sand, camouflaging as rocks to escape from the sea scorpion's grasp. However, it was the first major extinction event in the history of animal evolution, known as the Late Ordovician Extinction, that propelled the sea scorpions to the top of the food chain. During this extinction event, the sea levels experienced rapid fluctuations. While the cephalopods and trilobites of that time struggled to survive the extinction, the sea scorpions, possessing exceptional locomotive abilities, emerged as the greatest beneficiaries of the event. After the extinction, in the post-apocalyptic oceans, the sea scorpions were among the first groups to rise, overcoming the once dominant cephalopods and initiating the tragic history of the entire Mollusca lineage being reduced to mere seafood. During the prosperous era of the sea scorpions, the oceans were essentially their domain. In that epoch, sea scorpions, much like the fish in our present era, were the absolute rulers of the seas. Among them naturally emerged the pinnacle predators in the evolutionary history of arthropods. At that time, the predatory sea scorpions could be broadly categorized into two major groups. The majority of sea scorpions belonged to the assassin type group. They had moderate swimming abilities and primarily crawled on the seafloor. However, their posterior ends evolved sharp tail spines and they were opportunistic hunters. Once they detected a target, they would immediately pounce, using their appendages evolved into sickles or pincers to immobilize their prey. They would then deliver a lethal strike with their tail spine, a combination of skills executed with great precision. On the other hand, there was a warrior-type group of sea scorpions. They utilized their powerful tail flaps and paddling appendages to pursue their prey, directly employing their massive chelicery to kill their victims. This straightforward and aggressive strategy led to a significant increase in their body size, granting them formidable locomotive capabilities capable of traversing vast oceans. As a result, they spread globally and became the most prosperous animal group during the Silurian period. Among them, the largest marine arthropod, the Pterygotus, evolved, a creature reaching up to two meters in length. Known for its strong offensive and defensive capabilities, as well as its remarkable speed, they were truly the unrivaled rulers of the ancient oceans. For approximately 40 million years, from the Silurian to the early Devonian, the sea scorpion family reigned supreme, exerting comprehensive dominance over mollusks and vertebrates. It was undoubtedly the golden age of sea scorpions. However, as the saying goes, power is not eternal. Just as their early chelicerate ancestors struggled to survive in the shadow of Anomalocaris, a similar fate befell their descendants, the sea scorpions. In all likelihood, it was during the evolutionary competition with sea scorpions that early fish gradually developed fast swimming fins and robust armor. Ultimately, during the peak of the sea scorpion dynasty in the late Silurian, one-jawed fish species evolved a weapon capable of countering the sea scorpion's most potent armament, the lower jaw. Merely 10 million years later, these jawed fish flourished and grew in strength. Occupying the top of the food chain, large-jawed fish seemed perfectly designed to eradicate sea scorpions. The sea scorpion's armor was defenseless against their powerful bites, and their chelicery and venomous stingers were rendered futile against the jawed fish's sturdy bony plates. At the seabed, the jawed fish revolutionized efficient locomotion and feeding capabilities, effortlessly usurping all food resources from small sea scorpions. The war rapidly transformed into a one-sided massacre. Within less than 10 million years since the rise of jawed fish, the sea scorpions faced complete defeat. Some sea scorpions sought refuge in freshwater, where they retained a trace of their family's dwindling glory. Around 400 million years ago, in the early Devonian, there existed Gecolopterus, one of the largest arthropods known to history, with a length of up to 2.5 meters. However, this prosperity was short-lived as jawed fish swiftly invaded freshwater habitats. Thus, the descendants of these sea scorpions began another cycle of defeat. The last remaining large sea scorpions were the Hibertopterus, 
living in the swamps from the Carboniferous to the end of the Permian. But even in this group of cumbersome and slow-moving Hibertopterus, the former glory of the family was nowhere to be found. They faded away from history with an almost shameful demeanor, marking the end of their lineage. But the story of sea scorpions did not end there. To understand the complete picture, let's go back to the Ordovician period. During the early evolution of Chalicerates, a basal branch took a completely different evolutionary path. They remained inconspicuous for millions of years, but they were among the earliest animals to venture onto land, leaving behind the spiritual spark for the sea scorpion family. They later gave rise to the final prosperity of the Chalicerate lineage, the Arachnida. The earliest arachnids were creatures that resembled scorpions. Like their marine relatives, they evolved formidable chelicerian stingers, reenacting the family's predatory prowess on a different battlefield. Scorpion-like animals also thrived in ancient times. In the Carboniferous period, around 340 million years ago, there were even pulmonoscorpius, reaching lengths of up to 70 centimeters, seemingly resurrecting the chelicerate lineage's former glory. However, the fear of being suppressed by vertebrates was always a looming threat to chalicerates, like a sword of Damocles. As vertebrates encroached further onto land, the last stronghold of chalicerates also became precarious. At this time, misfortune struck again, as fate played a deadly joke on the chalicerates, the rise of insects. In a series of miraculous coincidences, insects gained the ability to fly. Coupled with their highly sensitive antennae, well-developed compound eyes, and complex mouthparts derived from specialized appendages, they possessed the most luxurious and top-tier equipment of their time. However, these advancements turned chalicerates into helpless creatures once again. Their former homes were shattered and the established order collapsed. The vertebrates that roamed the earth became invincible monsters of the apocalypse while the elusive insects became like bandits pillaging the wasteland. To make matters worse, chalicerates faced internal troubles amidst external threats. Their outdated body structure, with only a pair of chalicerae, severely limited their feeding efficiency. The premature loss of many appendages greatly compromised their evolutionary potential. They couldn't even evolve antennae. Remember, if you encounter an animal with antennae, it has no close relationship with spiders or scorpions. Moreover, during the transition of arachnids to land, they lost their compound eyes, rendering their senses ill-suited for the harsh terrestrial environment. The primitive respiratory system derived from book gills further hindered their access to sufficient oxygen, severely restricting their responsiveness and speed. At this perilous moment, a brand new arachnid emerged, turning the tides for chalicerates. That arachnid was the spider. In fact, from the Ordovician period to the present day, there have been numerous arachnids with forms ranging between scorpions and spiders on land. However, spiders can be considered the group that underwent the most thorough self-transformation, playing a surprising trump card. They transformed their chelicerae into venomous fangs, using venom to subdue their prey. This helped them overcome the challenge of limited strength and speed. Additionally, the venom contained digestive enzymes that could externally digest their prey, allowing them to directly suck the liquefied flesh and solve the problem of low feeding efficiency. What's more, they utilized the last traces of their evolutionary potential by modifying residual structures and glands in their abdomen into silk-producing spinnerets. From then on, silk became an essential tool for spiders. Early spiders lay in wait in underground burrows, compensating for their lack of speed through ambush. At the same time, they secreted copious amounts of silk. On one hand, it fortified their burrows, and on the other hand, the silk extended to the surface, transmitting subtle vibrations to the spider, enabling them to sense movements in their surroundings, compensating for their sensory shortcomings. Later, no later than 140 million years ago in the early Cretaceous period, some spiders ventured out of their burrows. They spun webs coated with adhesive silk, suspending them in treetops. During the Cretaceous period, 
insects underwent a massive explosion. But this time, insects were no longer a major problem for chalicerates. Instead, they became an endless source of food for spiders, paving the way for the revival of chalicerates. Even today, arachnids remain the second largest group of animals after insects. Even in human society, various spiders are among the most common animals. They are ubiquitous. Perhaps from the perspective of winners and losers, chalicerates may be considered failures. The once dominant sea scorpions have gradually dwindled to tiny spiders today. They are helpless against vertebrates that have taken their place, leaving them with nothing but a sigh. However, they are also successful. No matter how many times this world knocks them down, they always manage to rise again. They constantly defy the odds and proclaim their glory to the world. They may be insignificant in their individual lives with fleeting existence, but as a group, they endure through the ages, persevering and perpetuating. 